The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 9, Part 2 Most assuredly you are dismissed, young lady, he said coldly. We will have to consider seriously whether or not Mercy is responsible enough to continue such a position. When the men had gone, neither girl spoke a word. Mercy pulled herself about the room, riding an upturned chair, straightening out the scuffed primers. Two great tears ran slowly down her cheeks. The sight of Mercy's tears was more than Kit could endure. If she looked at them for another instant, she would fly into a thousand pieces. In a panic, she fled, out the door and down the roadway, running blind to reason or decorum, past the meeting house, past the loiterers near the town pump, past the houses where her pupils lived. She scarcely knew where her feet were taking her, but something deep within her had chosen a destination. She did not stop until she reached the great meadow. There, without thinking, she left the pathway, plunged into a field, and fell face down in the grass, her whole body wrenched with sobs. The tall grass rustled over her head and hid her from sight, and the meadows closed silently around her and took her in. When Kit had sobbed herself out, she lay for a long time, too exhausted to move or think. Perhaps she slept a little, but presently she opened her eyes and became aware of the smell of the warm earth and the rough grass against her face. She rolled over and stretched, blinking up at the blue sky. The tips of the long grasses swished gently in the breeze. The hot sun pressed down on her so that her body felt light and empty. Slowly, the meadow began to fulfill its promise. All at once, with an instinctive quickening of her senses, Kit knew that she was not alone, that someone was very close. She started up. Only a few feet away, a woman was sitting watching her. A very old woman with short, cropped white hair and faded, almost colorless eyes set deep in an incredibly wrinkled face. As Kit stared at her, she spoke in a rusty, murmuring voice. Thee did well, child, to come to the meadow. There is always a cure here when the heart is troubled. For a moment, Kit was too dumbfounded to move. I know, the murmuring voice went on. Many's the time I found it here myself. That is why I live here. Kit stiffened with a cold prickle against her spine. Those thin, stooped shoulders that tattered gray shawl. This was the queer woman from Blackbird Pond. Hannah Tooper, the witch. The girl stared horror-struck at the odd-shaped scar on the woman's forehead. Was it the devil's mark? Folks wonder why I want to live here so close to the swamp, the soft, husky voice continued. But I think thee knows why. I could see it on thy face a moment back. The meadow has spoken to thee too, hasn't it? The cold feeling began to pass away. In some unexplainable way, this strange little creature seemed to belong here, so much a part of this quiet, lonely place that her voice might have been the voice of the meadow itself. I didn't really intend to come here, Kit found herself explaining. I always meant to come back, but this morning I just seemed to get here by accident. Hannah Tooper shook her head as though she knew better. Thee must be hungry, she said, more briskly. Come, and I'll give thee a bite to eat. She hitched herself awkwardly to her feet. Reminded of the time, Kit leaped up and shook out her skirts. I must go back, she said hastily. I must have been gone for hours. The woman peered up at her, her eyes almost lost in the folds of leathery wrinkles had a humorous gleam. A toothless smile crinkled her cheeks. Thee better not go back looking so, she advised. Whatever it is, thee can stand up to it better with a bit of food inside. 
Come along, tis no distance at all. Kit wavered. She was suddenly ravenous, but more than that, she was curious. Whatever this queer little woman might be, she was certainly harmless and unexpectedly appealing. Like the school children, she had accepted Kit without a question or suspicion. And like a child, she scuttled ahead now, confident that Kit would accept her in the same way. Giving way to her own impulse, Kit hurried after her. Late as it was, she was far from eager to return to her Uncle Matthew's. The little hut with its sparsely thatched roof sagged at one corner. It looked as though it could never survive a stiff wind, let alone a flood. Two goats munched at the edge of a small vegetable patch. There's a well behind the house, said Hannah. Draw some water and wash thy face, child. Kit let the bucket down, leaning over to watch it meet the far-off circle of reflected light. The water was deliciously cold on her hot face, and she gulped it thirstily straight from the bucket. Then she smoothed her hair and retied her apron and went into the little house. The one small room the house contained was scoured as a seashell. There was a table, a chest, a bedstead with a faded quilt, a spinning wheel, and a small loom. A few ancient kettles hung about the clean, swept hearth. From a square of sunlight on the floor, an enormous yellow cat opened one eye to look at them. Hannah had set a wooden trencher on the table with a small corn cake studded with blueberries, and beside it, a gourd filled with yellow goat's milk. She sat watching as Kit ate taking nothing herself. Probably, Kit thought too late, swallowing the last crumb. That was every bit of dinner she had. The girl looked about her. "'Tis a pretty room, she said without thinking, and then wondered how that could be when it was so plain and bare. Perhaps it was only the sunlight on the boards that were scrubbed smooth and white, or perhaps it was the feeling of peace that lay across the room, as tangibly as the bar of sunshine. Hannah nodded. My Thomas built this house. He made it good and snug, or it wouldn't have stood all these years. How long have you lived here, Kit asked curiously. The woman's eyes clouded. I couldn't rightly tell, she said vaguely, but I remember well the day we came here. We walked from Dorchester in Massachusetts, you see. Days on end we'd been without seeing another human being. Someone had told us there would be room for us in Connecticut. But in the town, there was not an inch of land to spare, not after they'd seen the brand on our foreheads. So we walked toward the river, and then we came to the meadow. It put us in mind of the marshes near Hythe. My husband was raised in Kent and t'was like coming home to him. Here is where he would stay, and nothing could change him. There were a hundred questions Kit dared not ask. Instead, she looked about the room and noticed with surprise that one ornament it contained. Jumping to her feet, she seized from the shelf the small rough stone and held it in her hand. Why, tis coral, she exclaimed. How did it get here? A small, secret smile brightened the wrinkled face. I have a seafaring friend, Hannah said importantly. Whenever he comes back from a voyage, he brings me a present. Kit almost laughed. Of all the unlikely things, a romance. She could imagine him, this seafaring friend, white-haired and weather-beaten, coming shyly to the door with his small treasures from some distant shore, Perhaps this came from my home, she considered, turning the stone in her hands. I come from Barbados, you know. Do tell, from Barbados, marveled the woman. He seemed different somehow. It is like paradise, the way he says. Sometimes I mistrust he's just telling tales to an old woman. 
Oh, everything he told you is true, answered Kit fervently. It is so beautiful. Flowers every day of the year. You can always smell them in the air, even out to sea. He's been homesick, said Hannah softly. Yes, admitted Kit, laying down the stone. I guess I have. But most of all, I miss my grandfather so much. That is the hardest, nodded the woman. What was thy grandfather like, child? Tears sprang into Kit's eyes. No one since she had come to America had ever really wanted to hear about grandfather, except Reverend Bulkley, who had only been impressed by his royal favors. She scarcely knew where to begin, but all at once she was finding eager, incoherent words for the happy days on the island, the plantation, the long walks together in the swimming, the dim, cool library and the books. Then she came to the flight to Connecticut and all the bitterness and confusion of the past weeks. I hate it here, she confessed. I don't belong. They don't want me. Aunt Rachel would, I know, but she has too many worries. Uncle Matthew hates me. Mercy is wonderful, and Judith tries to be friendly. But I'm just a trouble to them all. Everything I do and say is wrong. So thee came to the meadow, said Hannah, patting the girl's hand with her small, gnarled claw. What went so wrong this morning? She listened, nodding her head like a wizened owl as the tale of the morning's woes came pouring out. As Kit reached the part about the schoolmaster and his cane, to her amusement, a rusty chuckle interrupted her. Hannah's face had crumpled into a thousand gleeful wrinkles. Kit hesitated, and all at once the memory struck her funny too. Her breath caught tremulously, and then she was laughing with Hannah. But instantly she sobered again. What am I to do now, she pleaded. How can I ever go back and face them? Hannah said nothing for a long time. Her faded eyes studied the girl beside her, and now there was nothing childlike in that wise, kindly gaze. Come, she said, I have something to show thee. Outside the house, against a sheltered wall to the south, a single stalk of green thrust upwards, with a slender rapier-like leaves and one huge scarlet blossom. Kit went down on her knees. It looks just like the flowers at home, she marveled. I didn't know you had such flowers here. It came all the way from Africa, from the Cape of Good Hope, Hannah told her. My friend brought the bulb to me, a little brown thing like an onion. I doubted it would grow here, but it just seemed determined to keep on trying. And look what has happened. Kit glanced up suspiciously. Was Hannah trying to preach to her? But the old woman merely poked gently at the earth around the alien plant. I hope my friend will come while it is still blooming, she said. He will be so pleased. I must go now, Kit said, getting to her feet. Then something prompted her to add honestly. You've given me an answer, haven't you? I think I know what you mean. The woman shook her head. The answer is in thy heart, she said softly. Thee can always hear it if thee listens for it. Back along South Road, Kit walked with a lightness and freedom she'd never known since the day she sailed into Saybrook Harbor. Hannah Tooper was far from being a witch, but certainly she had worked a magic charm. In one short hour, she had conjured away the rebellion that had been seething in the girl's mind for weeks. Only one thing must be done before Kit could truly be at peace, and without speaking a word, Hannah had given her the strength to do it. Straight up Broad Street she walked, up the path to a square frame house, and knocked boldly on the door of Mr. Eliezer Kimberly. And we'll stop here. And continue in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.